Hello and welcome to the Golden Path to Spring One. My name is Dan Vega. I'll be your host for today's event. Uh, the Golden Path to Spring One is a new show that airs every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, as we lead up to Spring One at VMware Explore. Today we are lucky enough to have Matt Rabel with us, who's going to be talking to us about reactive microservices with Spring Boot and Jay Hipster. Matt, my friend, really good to see you. How are you doing today? Great to see you. I'm doing excellent. I just finished a, a nice ski weekend, and I'm off to Crested Butte after this, so life is good. That is great to hear. Great to hear. So what are we talking about today? I know what the title is, but can you kind of give me a summary of what we're in store for? Yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about you know reactive microservices versus regular microservices, and then do like half the talk should be a demo where I basically use Spring Boot 3 and Spring Cloud to create a microservices architecture and then awesome. use OpenID Connect to secure it all and do like access tokens that secure it between the microservices and all that. Cool. Really looking forward to this one. I'm excited to, to see what you have to, to show us off today. So I'm going to just a quick show note for everyone. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, what I will do is I will collect these questions behind the scenes for Matt and let him kind of focus on the presentation. And when I can find some, you know, a couple of questions that are kind of relevant to what we're talking about, we'll go ahead and pop in and ask Matt. And we'll also leave some time at the end for questions. So please feel free to ask those questions. I'll be moderating the chat. Uh, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Matt, and uh, let you do your thing. So thank you. All right. Want to play the presentation here. So welcome to Reactive Java Microservices with Spring Boot and Jay Hipster. The image on the title slide here is from Unsplashed, and I just searched for spring, and you know I really like the image. Looks like uh, kind of winter's leaving, spring's coming, which is what we're going through here in Colorado. So that's very exciting. Uh, this blog post is basically uh, based on a or, or this. Uh, presentation was based on a, a blog post that I wrote uh, called Reactive Java Microservices. And you might notice the font is Pacifico. And you might have seen this on Jay Hipster's website. So this was very much like a spring image that I grabbed from spring.io about doing microservices. Then I added in, you know, a little Jay Hipster stuff. So you might be like, what is Jay Hipster? Well, so it started out in 2013 or 14, I think. Uh, as just an application generator. So back then we had Spring MVC. We didn't quite have Spring Boot yet, right? That was April 1st, 2014. So this was like fall of 2013. And AngularJS was like the big JavaScript framework at the time. So Julian Dubois and another guy founded the project to basically make it so Java developers could develop applications without like installing Node, right? So I think even when they first created the project, uh, they were on a project that used Ant, so unfortunate for them. But you know, it was all about making it convenient for Java developers to do JavaScript development. And since then, it's really grown. It's you know, it's not Angular JS anymore. It's Angular, and it's not Angular two. It's just Angular, and we added support for React and Vue on the front end. And then the back end can be Spring Boot, um, can be Quarkus, can be a number of different ones. But the Quarkus and the other ones is powered by Blueprints. We're not really going to get into that today, but there is a plethora of options when you're creating a J-Hipster application. So what I like to say is it's kind of like a choose your own adventure book, but as a tool. So you choose, you know, if you want to do SQL or NoSQL, or you choose whether you want to do microservices or a monolith. So to use J-Hipster, you start just by installing it with NPM. So like I said, uh, they created this so Java developers wouldn't have to use Node tools. But this is just a creation of the project. You can actually, once you create it, you don't really need Node installed anymore. Um, you can create a directory and CD into it and then run jhipster. So you might notice that take command. That's pretty cool because it does uh, make dir and CDs into it. So pretty handy and convenient. And since then, we've added other options. So there's not just like a, uh, a command line to create your apps. There's also an online tool similar to start.spring.io and a JDL option, which I'll get to in a minute. So if you start just by typing jhipster, it'll prompt you for a number of different options. Do you want to do a monolith? Do you want to do a gateway or a microservice? Do you want to use Spring MVC or Spring Webflux? The authentication type, we support session. If you're doing microservices, obviously sessions doesn't work, but JWT will work or OAuth and OpenID Connect. 
There's also the database type, whether it's SQL or NoSQL, the build tool, Maven or Gradle, and the web framework, you know, React, uh, uh, Angular, or uh, Vue. And then also, if you don't, if that's not good enough, it also comes with like internationalization. So it'll internationalize your front end and your back end. And we also offer Cypress for end to end testing and Gatling if you want to do performance testing in your back end API. So there's a whole marketplace that you can do even more than that. I mentioned start.jhipster.tech. This is jhipster online. So you can actually log into that tool and answer all those same questions and then push your project to something like GitHub or you can just download it locally. So um, that's pretty convenient as well. And it started as you know an open source project, Apache license back in October 21st, 2013. The first commit from Julian Dubois was a hipster stack for Java developers. Yeoman plus Maven plus Spring, plus AngularJS in one handy generator. And the first public release was December 7th, 2013. So it was actually before Spring Boot was even released. And then once Spring Boot was released, we quickly adopted it after. And since then, it's grown quite a bit. We had almost 2 million downloads in 2020. Uh, it did go down a bit last year, but it's still you know, thriving and, and doing very well. And I didn't introduce myself yet. So my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana, no electricity, no running water. That was the cabin my grandfather, great-grandfather, built in 1917. They were immigrants from Finland. And uh, the sauna, which isn't pictured, was actually built before that because, you know, they're Finnish. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, and our two awesome kids, Abby and Jack. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him off eBay in 2004, and it took me 12, 13 years to make him look like this. So... You could call them an expensive obsession. If you have a similar obsession with classic Volkswagen, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I work for a company called Okta. My dad called him Okra for the first three years I worked there. Now he's graduated to calling it Okta, so he's getting a little better. And a couple of years ago, we bought our biggest competitor, Auth0. And what we've learned since we bought Auth0 is, well, they do developers better than the Okta what we call customer identity team did. So we recently pivoted where we're leading with Auth0 when we're talking to developers. So I work in the Auth0 product unit now, and a lot of what I will talk about today will show you how to use Auth0. You could use Okta if you're already like a customer or using Okta in your company and you want to develop like an app that your employees use. It'll work the same. The beauty of what we're going to see here today is it's Spring Security and it's OAuth support, and really it'll work or should work with any identity provider. In fact, when you create a new jhipster app with Auth0 or with OAuth, I always get the two mixed up, uh, it'll actually default to Keycloak. So that runs in a Docker container and everything works just great. So I like to start off with a brief history of Spring and microservices. Because there's a lot of things that make up a reactive microservices architecture with jhipster. And so it started in October, 2002. Rod Johnson writes J2E design and development. And I don't know if you read that, but I read it and it was very impactful for me back then. I was just kind of getting into open source and Java. I uh, did a lot with struts. I think I became a struts committer in like 2003 or four. And so, you know, they were the competitor to struts with Spring MVC. And, you know, I'd never used DJBs, but, you know, they, they said you didn't need to. And I was like, well, that's cool. I don't have to, that would be nice. 2004, Spring 1.0 came out. The fun thing about uh, 2004 there is that was, I think, end of March. There was two other technologies that came out around then. It was a uh, Flex 1.0 and JSF 1.0. And which one's still around? Spring. They've done a great job of backwards compatibility over the years and really, you know, doing what developers want them to do. And so 2006, Spring 2.0 came out with better XML. And, uh, you know, by 2009, we called it XML Hell even though Java config came out from the spring team, just not a lot of people used it. And then there was a stagnation of like Java itself, right? Java eight was kind of not doing a lot. And, uh, and spring boot 1.0 came out on April 1st, April Fool's day, 2014. And so that was a big like revolution in the spring community. I remember Josh Long, like pulling me aside at DevOps and being like, you got to see this, check it out. You can, you know, SSH into it. So cool. And, uh, and then a year later, Spring Cloud 1.0 came out. And that kind of really gave the baseline that you needed in Java to build microservices. And so let's look at microservices and their history. So 
the visionaries, the guys that get a lot of credit for it, are James Lewis in the top left there, Martin Fowler in the top right, and Adrian Cockroft and Joel Walls. And so uh, Adrian Cockroft was at Netflix at the time and kind of described the architecture as fine grain SOA, and he pioneered the style at web scale, as did Joe Walms, Dan North, Evan Botcher, and Graham Tackley. And then Martin Fowler and James Lewis wrote an article titled simply Microservices. So you might have read this on Martin Fowler's blog, and the date was March 25th, 2014. So you notice Spring Boot came out a week later. Spring Cloud came out a year later. So I think there's a lot of convergence, at least in the Java community, around that article, these technologies, and what we you know, build microservices with today. So years later, this is still considered like the definitive article that defines microservices. And in that article, he references Conway's Law which basically says any organization that designs a system will produce a design that whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So a lot of times what happens is you have UI specialists, front end engineers, for example, middleware specialists, which might be your job developers, and then your DBAs. And so if you have that sort of communication structure in your company, what will typically happen is the you know, front end developers will have a hard time getting you know, the back-end developers to do something. So they tend to do it in the front end. Same thing with the back-end developers and the DBAs, right? Uh, the DBAs could probably create a stored procedure to make things faster, but instead they do all that logic in Java because it takes so long for the DBAs to get stuff done. So that's what smart teams do, right? It's what they're like inclined to do, you know, forcing the logic into whatever application they have access to. So it's an example of Conway's law in action. And if you have a organization structure like that, it's going to be very difficult for you to do microservices. So the philosophy of a microservices architecture is essentially the same as Unix, Unix philosophy, which is do one thing and do it well. It's very easy to work on one small thing and you know no single program represents the whole application. And if you're using like HTTP as a communication mechanism between them, well, the microservices can be written in anything. It can be Java, it can be Ruby, it can be Node, it can be Go, you know, .NET doesn't really matter. So Spring Boot does Java very well, and I love the logo because it kind of represents to me like the on-off switch of enterprise Java these days. Everyone's using it, everyone loves it. Most of you watching this probably know that it, what it does and all its features, right? But just to go through a few of them, you know, automatically configure Spring whenever possible, so that kind of got rid of XML hell and even made Java config not so bad because you didn't have to you know, write a lot of code to make it work. It's got those production ready features such as metrics, health checks, and externalized configuration. The first couple are from you know, subsequent projects or add-ons like Actuator, but the externalized configuration was huge. I remember being in a client in 2014 where we just integrated or converted a Spring MVC app to Spring Boot just for that externalized configuration feature. There's no code generation, right? I think the Spring team dabbled in Spring Roo for a while, and uh, that was very difficult to maintain. So they, there's no co code generation that happens. There's no XML. Um, you can import XML if you did want to configure things that way. And one of the big revolutions at the time was embedding the app server, right? Tomcat, Undertow, or Jetty. There was a project called Drop Wizard that did it first, um, but Spring Boot copied it, and it's been very successful since then. And then, obviously, you can use you know, whatever build tool you want. They recently changed start.spring.io to use Gradle by default, so there's some uh, opinionated things going on there. And so Spring Framework 5 was released in September 2017. So that's almost six years ago, right? It's been a while. Uh, it builds on Reactor and the Reactive Stream set specification. It also includes the new Spring WebFlex, um, you know, basically a Reactive Runtime and Component Model. And Spring Boot 2.0 added that in March 1st, 2018. So again, it's been here for a while. And people often ask me, should I use Spring MVC or Spring WebFlux? And what I heard from someone on the Spring team, I think defines it well. And that is performance differences are negligible unless you are doing a lot of API calls at a scale of at least 500 requests per second, give or take. So I believe that a lot of the impetus behind Spring WebFlux was for these large clients that have very hefty cloud bills to the tune of millions of dollars a month. And if they were to use something like Spring WebFlex 
to optimize how much hardware resources is used, well, you can save millions of dollars a month. So um, that's what Spring Web Flex was kind of built for. If you're just developing a, a small app, maybe a monolith, you might not need Spring Web Flex. But I do think a lot of the concepts in it are worth learning because it's like the Java Streams API and you know the reactive stream stuff. And you know it's a different programming style. So it's nice to learn new things. So just to take a look at some of the code to compare, here is a Spring MVC method that creates a new points object. So this is from a sample app that I wrote for the jhipster mini book, and this uses Spring MVC. And you can see what happens there is it just you know takes in a points object, saves it in a points repository, saves it in a search repository so Elasticsearch can search for it, and then returns a response in JSON. And then if you were to look at a Spring Webflux equivalent, you will see, well, quite a bit more code. In fact, more than 30% more code. So MVC, 14 lines of code. Here we have 22 lines of code. And you can see once you hit that first, you know, saving the uh, object into the points repository, you can't block, right? It's a non-blocking framework. So you have to map that into the search repository. And then you have to map those results into the response that you return to the client. So an API gateway is an integral part of a microservices architecture, as is service discovery. And so when we started migrating jhipster, I think it was uh, Spring Boot 2.6, maybe 2.7, uh, they basically took away the support for Zool in Spring Cloud. And it was largely because the Netflix team had Zool 1, which was blocking and not reactive. And they had just released Zool 2, which was reactive. But the Spring team, and maybe it was because of clients, you know, for VMware or Pivotal or something like that, basically decided to write their own gateway. Instead of using Zool for routing, they were like, we're going to write our own. So they created Spring Cloud Gateway. And how an API gateway works in a microservices arch architecture such as this one is you'll see a user requests like an endpoint. That's step number one, right? That goes to the gateway. And then Spring Security will like redirect them to log in at their IDP like Okta. And then the user authenticates and authorizes. And then it comes back step four. And the API gateway will basically route that request to the downstream microservice. And then the car service has its own Spring Security configuration to act as a resource server, they call it. So it can validate that JWT, that access token, and give the person access. And so what I like about this graphic is I actually made it for a blog post that I wrote about Spring Cloud Gateway a couple of years ago. And someone emailed me on LinkedIn and was like, I work for Volkswagen. And that replicates or looks a lot like our microservices architecture. <laughs> and part of me is like, oh, my God, that's so simple. I can't believe you said that. But that's kind of cool because I'm a big Volkswagen fan. So we're also going to show you, or I'm going to show you today, how to use uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth in this microservices architecture, and largely because friends don't let friends write authentication. But also, what we originally had before OAuth and OpenID Connect was tools like uh, LinkedIn or Yelp. As soon as you completed the signup process, they would prompt you for your Gmail credentials. And so you'd be giving someone you know, like LinkedIn your username and password, and then they'd be using that to log into your contacts, get your Google contacts, and basically spam your friends. And so we needed a way to do delegated authorization so you didn't have to give your credentials to someone like LinkedIn, and that's where you know OAuth 2 came along. So that didn't really come along and provide delegated authorization until 2012, and then OpenID Connect added federated identity on top of that in 2014 because without OAuth, or without OpenID Connect, there is no identity. All you have is a random string of characters, can be a jot, doesn't have to be, and that is your access token. So together, they offer a standard spec you can write against and have confidence that it'll work across identity providers. So just to give you an example of authorization code flow, which is the most secure flow you can have in an application, if you integrated OAuth with something like Yelp, you would click the Connect with Google button, it would go to your authorization server. In this case, it's you know accounts.google.com. Chances are you're already logged in, so you don't even see the login prompt. 
and then it requests consent from the resource owner, that's you, asks you, can they access your public contacts, comes back to that redirect URI, back to your app with that authorization code. And on a back channel, this is not on the browser, right? Between your Spring Boot app and the authorization server, it exchanges a code for an access token and an ID token. And then you know who the user is and you can you know, display their name or whatnot. So another important part of microservices architectures are Docker and Kubernetes. I'm not gonna go into them too much, except to say that jhipster supports both. And so now what we'll do is we'll create a microservices architecture with jhipster's domain language. That's how we know we're hip, right? We got our own domain language. We'll run the apps and uh, end to end tests. We'll switch identity providers from Keycloak to Auth0, and then we'll run everything with Docker. So this uh, link right here goes, not quite yet, to a GitHub repo where I have the demo script. So you could create this whole thing yourself if you want. So I'm gonna start by exiting out and then opening this up and then we'll do some screen sharing here. So let me uh, make sure that works. Screen mirroring, make sure I'm doing the right one. If there's any questions in the meantime, you can go ahead and relay those to me. I'm gonna make this in the, hold on. Make that one the main one. Make this one the mirrored one. And then let me make it a little bit bigger. All right, so hopefully you can all see that okay. And in this reactive J hipster is where we have our demo script. So demo.adoc here, and I'll go ahead and this is written in ASCII doc. So if I put it on the left there, it'll have all my instructions. So Java 17, Node 18 and Docker, let's uh, make sure I have those. And first of all, um, I did actually create the application beforehand because I've noticed sometimes with StreamYard, like it does slow things down. So, you know, this might've taken a couple minutes and I just saved us all that time. And if we go up to the top here, you can see I did it five minutes before we started and I just created a directory for our reactive stack and then ran jhipster jdl reactive ms.jdl. So make sure we have Java 17 on the right there and then node version. And it does say node 18 here. So everything does work with node 18, um, but I found some bugs because I am actually working off the master branch of jhipster or not the master main, right? We use the main branch, don't use master as your branch name. And then uh, Docker, right? Let's make sure we got that going. Okay. And so to use the latest version of jhipster that supports Spring Boot 3, since we haven't had a jhipster 8, like alpha or beta release yet, you need to clone the repo, CD into it, and run npm install and npm link. And once you do that npm link, it installs it in your node, like binary directories, and then you can use jhipster as you normally would. So like I said, I created the uh, reactive stack directory, and then I got to do git and it in there. Well, we're not checking this in, so it doesn't matter. But basically, every app I created has their own Git repo right now. And so, you know, you'll notice there's nothing here. But if I go into the gateway, it's got, you know, a main. And if I do Git remote, there's nothing there. But it does have that uh, Git directory right there. And so to look at the reactive stack, you can open the whole thing up in IntelliJ. And I think it's important to just look at the JDL first because that's what defines this whole stack. And you could use a command line and create like the gateway, you know, in one command and answer all the questions in the, the you know, microservices in the other one, but that's kind of tedious. So that's why I use the JDL for it. And there's actually a, a plugin for IntelliJ that supports the JDL. And look at that. It's even got a diagram of how everything looks. So pretty sweet. One of the guys at JetBrains created that. And so if you look at this main application, it's the gateway. We say reactive is true. And for the gateway, we actually force reactive to true because they removed the ability to have, you know, a non-reactive gateway because before you could use Zool, right? And it would be non-reactive. And now that Spring Cloud Gateway is only reactive, 
well, even if you took this out, we would still make it reactive by default. So I just put it in there so people recognize it. Um, application type is gateway. OAuth 2 is the authentication type. You have to use the same authentication type between all your microservices. We're using Gradle and View, and then Eureka for the service discovery type, and Cypress for the test frameworks. And then it has these entities that end up in the gateway for doing you know, the UI that talks to the backend microservices. And then there's the blog, has everything that's very similar, except for a microservice application type, and it uses Neo4j. Of course, you have to have a different uh, port to run it on, so that's why we do that. And then the store uses MongoDB, and it has a product entity. And this one has a blog post and tag. So those are the two different microservices. And then down at the bottom, there's uh, some information for Docker Compose. So it can actually create uh, the files that you need to just start everything with one command. So back to my instructions here. We've already done that. And then we'll CD into the gateway. CD gateway. And we don't have anything running in Docker, and we do need to start Keycloak, first of all, and then jhipsters registry, which is at Eureka server. So we'll start with jh keycloak up. That's a shortcut that I have. And the full command is docker compose f, points to that Docker file, and it imports all the users and the apps and everything that we've already configured it for keycloak. And then jh registry up. This is a oh my ZSH plugin. So if you're using oh my ZSH, you can use jhipster, and there's a link to it right there. And then we can start up the gateway with Gradle. And if we want to see what the registry looks like, you just do localhost 8761. There. And with Keycloak. And you can see that's what the registry looks like. And it's still executing you know, Gradle to start everything up. And like I said, we're doing everything from Java, right? So this is actually doing NPM install with a node plugin for Gradle and making sure, you know, everything's up to date there. And then it'll actually compile the Java code as well as compiling the TypeScript code. And then if we were to look at the gateway where well, that's going, one of the interesting things I think is, first of all, the web app is in source main web app, and then the Java app is source main Java. We can load all those Gradle files. And I like to look at the spring security mechanism because that's one of the things we're going to be showing the most of. So under config, there's a security configuration. And close that guy. We're going to set up our JDK here. And it's basically, you know, got a client registration repository. It's got a cache for the users. And a lot of this stuff won't be used unless you're using a mobile app. So we're smart enough. We have code in here that if you are in a mobile app, let's say an Ionic app or a React Native app, and you pass an access token to the jhipster app or the gateway in this case, and it doesn't have certain claims in it, like identity information about the user, we will go and look it up at the user info endpoint from the identity provider. So the rest of this is just you know, how we do uh, filters, setting up cookies, CSRF. Uh, we do a spa web filter to serve up those static files. We have a content security policy. I thought I set this up. Come on, baby. And then uh, all of the uh, authorized exchange stuff where the path matches, where we have to permit you know, certain things and require admin for other things. And then this is the OAuth2 login part, as well as the OAuth2 client. So this will work as an OAuth2 client to talk to your IDP as well, and an OAuth2 resource server. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff we do here to uh, make things more secure and look up from the user info endpoint, map like the roles coming from the IDP to spring security authorities and all that kind of stuff. So it looks like it's up. We can go to localhost 8080 and we can log in here. And if we were to go to look at entities, well, it doesn't exist, right? If you were to look in the you know, log, it tries to make that request and there's nothing there. So uh, we need to start those other services. So for the blog service, we need uh, Neo4j, so JH Neo4j up, and start it with Gradle. And for the store service, we need Mongo, so JH Mongo up, and start it up. 
and then we can watch the J Hipster registry thing to see when they register, right? So we have the blog and the gateway are registered. They're all started up. We're just waiting on that store. 204, so that's good. We got the store now. So if we refresh this, it still hasn't quite caught up yet. Let's try the product. So this is one of the issues that I do have a solution for. Um, but basically, I think it should work now. So we can, you know, I like beer. I like paying $5 for it, not 10 And uh, it even has support for images, right? So we could upload an uh, image here, save it, and it's all working. So um, this is from, you know, something I put in the database before. But you can see that it is talking to the back end. Now, the weird part was, you know, the UI still works and the back end doesn't, right? And you just got a 404. So I have a solution for that with micro front ends that I'll get to towards the end. But you also need to have a key cloak in your host file pointing to 127001. And that's just the nature of Docker because when you run this in Docker, in this particular instance, it'll work fine. Um, but when you run it in Docker, it'll actually use the logical name, which is key cloak to redirect you in the browser and it'll show key cloak in your address bar. So that's why you need to do that. If you have a better solution, like let me know. Um, but everything's up and running. So now we could run like Cypress tests in the gateway app. And it'll prove that our UI and the, the CRUD for those various entities is working. You can see it's pretty quick. For a while there on the M1, I'm on an M1 right now. Um, Cypress wasn't M1 compatible, so it really did take a while to run. Uh, but now it's pretty good and pretty fast. So um, the Swagger UI takes a little bit to load there, but it will eventually load. And then all the specs pass, right? 45 seconds. Not too shabby. And so now what we want to do is basically prepare it for production. Keycloak is you know, a superb open source identity provider. Love it. I love that you can use it in a Docker container. And I love Spring Security's OAuth and OIDC support. So the cool thing is to switch from Keycloak to something like Okta or Auth0 or you know, another provider like Azure AD, um, you just need to override three properties for Spring Security. So that's pretty awesome. And then Spring Cloud Gateway makes it easy to relay an access token between a gateway and its microservices. And it's just five lines of YAML. So this is in our application configuration file for Spring. And if we were to look at it just in the gateway, we could go to application.yml, uh, test one. Uh, a lot, right? Mm, here we go. And then look for token relay. And there it is. So Spring Cloud Gateway default filters and then a bunch of other stuff for doing the service discovery and, and routing that way. And so what I'm going to, I'm not going to show this because I already did it and it's kind of cumbersome, but you can use the Auth0 CLI to create a new application. So that's the Auth0 apps create command. You set up the reactive stack type as regular web application. The callback URLs, this is for the gateway. This is for the J Hipster registry. They're on different ports, so you need different redirect URIs. And then the allowed logouts are similar, just different ports. And then you'll need to create two roles, role admin and role user in your Auth0 dashboard. And then you can create a new user account in the user section, and then you assign those roles to it. And make sure when you create a new user, you know, verify their email um, before you know attempting to log in, it just won't work. And then the last thing you have to do is add a new action, which basically add, adds those roles to the ID token, right? That's right here, and the access token. And so I've already configured all that in my Auth0 tenant, so you don't have to watch me do that. And I have on my desktop here the settings for the Auth0 app. So we'll go ahead and open that text edit. It's probably the fastest one to open, right? So we'll just grab these values here. And then if we were to go into the JHipster registry configuration, that's in the gateway and Docker and central server config. 
localhost config right here. So this is the default information it creates. If we just replace it with our audience from Auth0 and our issuer from Auth0, as well as our client ID and client secret, then what Spring Cloud Config will do is distribute this information to all the microservices and the gateway, and it'll basically make it so you're sharing those same settings across all your apps, which is pretty slick. So we can, uh, you know, run jhipster registry down. Nobody really likes that. And then start it up again. And then I do believe you do need to restart all these microservices here. That's just a Gradle command, right? Gradle W. Everything starts up pretty quick. And now if we were to go to new incognito window, let's make sure we don't have any tokens stuck in our browser. Localhost 8080, click sign in, and it'll redirect us to Auth0. So I have one password eight, which is pretty slick because you could do like shift command, what is it, shift command spacebar, and then you can do like Auth0, shift command C, your password. That's a pretty slick feature of 1Password8. Continue, and I'm logged in, right? And I can see all those entities. I created a product, should still be there. There it is. So now we're using Auth0, and we're still you know, using this microservices architecture from jhipster. The last thing I wanted to show you is basically uh, creating Docker containers and running it all with Docker Compose. So if you did want to actually test all this with Cypress, you do have to set those credentials as environment variables there for Cypress C2 username and password. And now what we can do is stop all our Docker containers and our apps. We'll exit out of those. And stop all the Docker containers. And then we want to build Docker images for each app. So because I'm on an M1, you do have to add this extra parameter to pilot for ARM64 and also let me start this first. And into the blog. And into the store. This one. Um, I do have my Docker settings bumped up quite a bit. So resources, I think by default it uses two maybe CPUs and you know not much RAM. So you can see I've cranked it up quite a bit here. And that's because we are running like 15 or 16 containers once this is all said and done. So you do have to bump those up a bit or some apps might not start. So let's see how we're doing on the creating. Um, so the store and the blog took hardly any time. And that's because it's not doing anything for the front end stuff. The reason the uh, gateway takes so long is because that's where all the front end code, right? Is that's where all the TypeScript is. And so now that we have those, we can go into Docker compose directory. And do we still have IntelliJ open here? Yep. So in that directory, there's uh, this file that has all the different apps in it, right? And their databases for Postgres, for the blog, you know, for doing health checks, all that kind of stuff. And there's Keycloak down here at the bottom. We don't really need it because we're gonna configure it for Auth0, but there's a lot of um, other services that depend on it. For instance, right up here, right? So if you were to remove it, you'd have to go and remove all those conditions as well. But in this central server config, it's very similar to what we had before. And right here, we can grab this. So this is now for Docker, right? Our central server configuration. And we'll replace this. And then we can use Docker Compose up. And if you add dash D to that command, then you know, it'll run as a daemon. You won't see everything. But I kind of like to see all the colors and everything You know, starting up all the different apps. And of course, if you open up Docker Desktop, cancel out the settings, you can see all the different, you know, containers, view their, their actual logs if you wanted, right? You could go into this one and see the log if you wanted and see them all starting up. And you can see the gateway has 8080 running. Um, and you can also, you know, go back to this jhipster registry. It takes us dot zero. And everything looks like it's up and running. So refresh the gateway. 
Oh, it wants us to start over, so that's why you're using an incognito window, right? It's already logged in. That works. And we can say good beer, charge uh, Norway prices, and then uh, grab that image, save it. So that's all working, right? We're talking to that uh, you know, database, and everything's communicating within Docker. So that's pretty slick. And uh, you know, that's most of it. But one of the things I did want to show you is the problem with this architecture is everything's in the gateway. So it kind of kills the whole notion of microservices because if you made a change to an entity in the blog service, for instance, and the UI needs to change with it, you'd have to redeploy the actual gateway as well. So that's kind of tight coupling, which microservices allows us to get away from. So there is a feature here called micro front ends. And similar to the microservices article on Martin Fowler's blog, there was a micro front ends uh, article on uh, his blog as well. So it's become pretty popular in the last couple of years and uh, doesn't like it when I do full screen, it gets all dark there. So go out of there into the main directory and we can download a reactive mf.jdl and we can compare them. So if we were to compare them, you would see that I've changed a few things first. I'm using React, but you could use Vue. Um, you know, the reactive MS is the one you saw, and this is the reactive micro front ends over here. Um, the service discovery type, I just changed it to console because that's gonna be the default in jhipster8. Um, and then here's the, the key, right? Micro front ends, and it says it points to the blog in the store. And then the blog needs to be modified to have a test framework and a client framework, and then the store as well. And so once you have that, there's a few other things down here that I did to you know, add like Kubernetes and support and stuff like that, but it will basically generate the front end in the microservice. And so that means not only can you develop just that blog thing standalone, but you can also deploy it standalone. So that's pretty slick. And uh, here's the command that you would use to create that, that same architecture or similar one. And then there's a blog post here I wrote that goes through all of that. And uh, you know, down here, uh, we also have Kotlin. So if you want to do Kotlin as your backend, that is supported. And uh, you just use khipster instead of jhipster after you install this. And of course, all this code right, is in Octodev, Auth0, Java, microservices examples, and the reactive jhipster directory. So let me go back to my presentation here. Reopen it and play it. All right. So like I said, there's an article that I wrote on micro front ends for Java microservices use a very similar like, you know, entities as far as a blog microservice and a store microservice and does them with micro front ends. So today we learned, you know, all about Conway's law and microservices. And a lot of times what I've learned in my experience is microservices are meant for scaling teams and people. So you can have a hundred or a thousand developers working on the same, you know, system without them clobbering over each other. And I think I recently saw a note about like the majestic monolith that is Stack Overflow, right? In the sense of that is a monolith and it scales just fine, but they only have like 20 people or something like that. So a lot of times microservices are meant for large teams and you might not need them if you just have a small team. You learned about Spring Cloud and how it can, you know, make uh, Spring Cloud Gateway work and do all the nice things with OAuth. And we saw OAuth 0 by Okta there. So this was originally based on this article I wrote in 2021. The only difference between what I showed you today and this article is first of all, we're using Spring Boot 3. And this one uses Okta uh, customer identity instead of OAuth 0. And then I also wrote one on how to do uh, Kubernetes to the cloud with uh, Google Cloud Engine. GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. And then there's other ones that we have on dev.2 slash jhipster for, uh, what's the other ones? Uh, AWS, Azure, um, DigitalOcean, and one other one that I can't think of right now. And like I said, if you want to use Kotlin for the backend, you can certainly do that as well. Just install the uh, Kotlin Blueprint. And people often ask, this is where I need my speaker notes. Uh, so let me uh, change things up just a little bit here about Project Loom, right? Because that's a big thing. It's available these days. 
stop mirroring and play it. So people often ask, like, should you go reactive, right? If you're building CRUD apps, right? Probably not. Spring MVC is probably good enough. And are you dealing with massive amounts of streaming data and millions of customers? Then, you know, something like Spring Web Flux can really save you a fair amount of money on your monthly cloud bill. So consider it, look into it. Um, what about Project Loom? Will it allow you to write regular non-reactive code that performs as good as reactive frameworks? I'm not sure, but I, you know, I'm betting on reactive for now. And even though virtual threads and Project Loom might help your application, it's still not going to help like your communication to the database, right? So you're still going to need like reactive drivers to make it so it's non-blocking in that sense. And so, you know, I'm betting on reactive for now. I think it's a good skill for Java developers to have. But more importantly, there was a blog post published yesterday by Mark Thomas, who's one of the main people that works on Apache Tomcat. And it's about web applications and Project Loom. And he talks about, you know, let's look what virtual threads mean for web applications using some simple web applications deployed on Apache Tomcat. So he has some conclusions. And he says, web applications that experience blocking, such as classic Spring MVC on Tomcat, and have not switched to the serverless asynchronous API, reactive programming or other asynchronous APIs should see some scalability improvements by switching to a virtual thread-based executor. And depending on the web, web application, these improvements may be achievable with no changes to the web application code. So that's pretty exciting. And in this, he does actually have graphs and, uh, and you know, comparisons. Uh, so I, I invite you to check it out. And he also says, Web applications that have switched to using the servlet asynchronous API, reactive programming, or other asynchronous APIs are unlikely to observe measurable differences, positive or negative, by switching to a virtual thread-based executor. And so the cool thing is Tomcat does have support for virtual threads. It's experimental. I don't think it's released yet, but he goes over all that within this blog post, and I definitely invite you to check it out and learn from it like I did. And one of the big things that I did with JHipster when I first started using it back in like 2014 or 15 was just using it as a source of knowledge, right? I want to know how you're doing like CSRF with Spring Security and AngularJS at the time. And JHipster had it in there. So I invite you to just generate like a simple monolith with it to check it out. Maybe how to integrate, you know, NG Bootstrap or something like that. And then, you know, generate a microservices architecture to see how OAuth is done. And most of what we're doing is not like against any recommendations, right? We try to do what the frameworks recommend. So we're using Spring Security like they recommend Spring Security. We're not doing the authentication in the SPA app, right? That's the Vue, the Angular, or the React app because why would you store an access token on the browser if you don't have to? So we're doing it you know, on the back end with Spring Security, and then we're using good old cookies to keep that session alive on the front end. Works great. It's been five years, and since we integrated it, almost six, and we haven't had a problem. Like we haven't had that many complaints. And the thing that I really like is we don't have to maintain like an OIDC library for Angular, Vue, or React. We just maintain Spring Security on the back end. It all works great. So another way of looking at it, I think, is called back ends for front ends pattern. And uh, if you have control of your back end and front end, it's awesome. So the J Hipster mini book is a book that I wrote and I've updated it for the last uh, six years now. And the good news is there's a new release coming out. The bad news is it's for JHipster 7, but JHipster 8 hasn't been released yet. So why would I write about that? So it's a free download from InfoQ. Uh, the new version should be up, I guess, in the next week or two. And there's also a real world app, 21 points. The uh, source code is available on GitHub. You can go grab it. And the reason I wrote the, the app was because with Spring Boot, I noticed how it had such great monitoring of the health of your application. So I built 21 points to monitor my own health. And what it does is it tracks, like, if you eat well, if you exercise, and if you drink alcohol. So you can get 21 total points in a week. I usually try to get 15 or 16. And, you know, you lose a point if you drink or, you know, drink too much or, you know, eat sugar in my case or don't exercise in a day. So it's pretty cool that way. I really enjoyed writing that book. And I added a new chapter at the end. It used to be just microservices like you saw here, but now it shows microservices with micro front ends. 
So it's pretty slick. If you want to learn more, uh, Spring Boot Guides is excellent. And now there's Spring.Academy, I think. Uh, jhipster.tech is where you can learn more about jhipster. Uh, developerauth0.com, all about Auth0. And Stack Overflow, the lead developer on my team. That's because I work alone a lot, but I really like it. If you want to learn more, Okta Developer has a number of posts that I've written over the last you know, five years working there on uh, Java Spring Boot, Microservices, and JHipster. We also have a YouTube channel you might enjoy. And uh, we use the same handle, OctaDev, for GitHub, Twitter, and YouTube, and even Dev.2. And of course, make sure to check out the Oz0 Developer Center because they have lots of great tutorials as well and code samples, and you can connect with us. We have a, a monthly newsletter that goes out that you might enjoy. So try jhipster. This command right here won't work, right, until we release a new version of jhipster, at least for Spring MVs or Spring Boot 3. But you can clone the repo and do it that way. And all of the code that I created today, as well as that demo script, is on that repo there, auth0-java-microservices-examples. And may the auth be with you. So keep in touch. You can find me on rabeldesigns.com. That's my blog. I'm on Twitter at mrabel. This presentation is actually available up on Speaker Deck right now. I had it published as soon as this started. And then a lot of the code these days I write is on Octodev. Thank you so much, Matt. Appreciate it. We have a lot of questions. Um, I Some of them were more discussion, so I figured I'd just save them to the end so we can just chat about them. Uh, so yeah. why don't we get through them real quick here. Um, I have this first one here. Can you throw more light on when to move from MVC to reactive, like scale, drawbacks, et cetera? I know you mentioned a lot about that at the end, uh, even with Project Bloom is, is an option. Uh, any more thoughts on that, like when you might want to think about moving to reactive, or is it like your first thought right out of the box? Well, I haven't seen a whole lot of people do it, right? In the community, it seems like there was a lot of hype about reactive, you know, when Spring Webflex first came out, but I haven't seen like a whole sale movement towards it, right? <clears throat> and I say a lot of this because of like blog posts I write and videos I do where people are like, can I see a Spring MVC version, <laughs> right? And you're like, ah, <laughs> come on, I, I learned all this for this. But I, I, think, uh, I think, you know, the big thing is one, are you having performance problems, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're having performance problems and, you know, consider it, also, are you spending a lot on your cloud infrastructure or whatever bill you have that you're paying, right? And yep. if you're not, then, you know, it's kind of an exercise in learning new things, but it might not be necessary. Cool. Appreciate it. Um, what are you thinking about, what are your thoughts about Spring Authorization Server? Will it replace third-party solutions? Well, it is a third-party solution. <laughs> so... Um, I love it, right? We used to have UAA, our own basically server built on Spring's former authorization server in jhipster. And what we mm -hmm. found was difficult to maintain, right? Like someone's got to pick it up and maintain it. So if you're building your own identity provider basically with Spring authorization server, like be ready to maintain it, right? You aren't just going to build it once and it all works. Like you're going to have to upgrade the latest releases and stuff. But remember, I'm biased. I work for a competitor to spring authorization server. So I have to say that, right? But I think it's a great project, but like, I also wonder why would you use it instead of Keycloak, right? Keycloak's there and it's, you know, been there for a lot longer and it has very much the same capabilities, but I realize like some people want to customize everything, right? And so that's where spring authorization server comes in. All right. Um, can you please throw some light on the usage of Keycloak and what according to some of the important patterns uh, WRT reactive microservices. Well, I think, you know, the most important thing I think is to not, or to use uh, basically a, an identity provider in OAuth 2. And Keycloak is just a provider of that, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of the, the providers will try to tell you, you know, uh, what is it? Buy, don't build, or build, don't buy. Uh, basically, uh, don't build it yourself, right? So, my company and the salespeople are going to say, you know, don't use Keycloak because then you're building and maintaining yourself. Don't use Spring Authorization Server because then you're building and maintaining yourself. But guess what? Like you're still writing code to actually use Auth0, right? Or Okta or anything like that. So like, you know, salespeople take them with a grain of salt. We're still going to build something, right? Even if it requires 10 lines of code instead of a thousand, right? So um, 
Kiko, I think, is just great for doing local development. And then to put it in production, though, like now you got to harden it, right? You got to make sure you're storing information properly. You have the proper backups and everything like that. So that's why I like the third parties like us where we can do all that for you. Great. Um, I know that you shared this link with us a bunch of times, but you did move fast on a couple of sides. So it was hard to like grab the particular link. Can you share the link to the document? So the doc that you were going through as you were following the step-by-step -step instructions to work through that project, that demo, can you yep. share the link for that? Uh, maybe throw that in the chat. If I send in the private chat, you can share it in the main one. Absolutely. Maybe? Yep. I will get it out there. Um, and then another one, what is your approach when you need to change something that's generated um, in the generated project by JHipster? Do you regenerate it? Do you manually edit? Do you generate a new project and copy some parts of code over? What, what do you do when you need to like change something? So I think if you're, you know, it's the first day you start using it, just start from scratch, right? Adjust your JDL, regenerate it, you know, play with that a few times. But at some point, like, you know, I had, a, I had a similar project called AppFuse back in 2004, 2005 um, to Jay Hipster. And, and it was often a problem. People always want an upgrade path, right? And they actually yeah. want you in Jay Hipster to do the upgrade. And so for the most part, we have something, but it hasn't worked reliably, especially between major versions. And so a lot of times I just tell people like, trade it, create it like, or treat it like start.spring.io, where you basically start a new project. And after you've started it, you're on your own, right? Like yeah. everything's set up, but doing the manual edits. But there is a new project that's pretty exciting called JHipster Lite, where they actually do everything through Git. And uh, Julian Dubois has a great video out there from DevOps last year. But basically, it will manage your project for you in the sense that you can say, oh, I don't want to use Vue. I want to use React. And it'll make that change in your project for you. And it uses wow. Git to do everything. So that's pretty slick. That's awesome. So cool. Um, okay, a couple more here. How do you deal with a lot of redundant code generated by Jay Hipster? Do you remove this code, not use features, or leave a mess in the code base? I don't know if it's a mess, but uh, well, well, what I do don't you think, think about that? It should be, I don't think it should be redundant, right? So I almost consider that if there's stuff in the Jay Hipster code that's generated, like maybe we should do a better job of generating that code. Right. I do notice an IntelliJ when I'm using it. Right. Sometimes it'll be like, this is a duplicate code block here. Right. And so mm -hmm. there is probably some things we could do to clean it up. But I also think we don't use aspects a whole lot. And maybe we could use more of that. But, you know, that's uh, that's tough for new developers because they're like, how is this happening? And you're like, this class over here does it. So go check that out. Yeah. Yep. But but what I would say is if if you've used JHipster and see a bunch of redundant code in there, like, please go create an issue in the project and we'll try to make it so there isn't so much perfect um what do you think about using even source architecture with j hipster i don't even know what even source architecture is so um i think it's you... like event source right oh CQRS event source. Yeah. Yeah. there you go cqrs okay now we're now we're on the so, same page <laughs> <laughs> so if you went to like the j hipster github and searched in the issues for cqrs you would find that people have asked about it before and talked about it. And basically the current way Jay Hipster works with, you know, the CRUD generation feature, it doesn't make sense. Like if you're doing CQRS, it's not CRUD and we're not going to adapt the CRUD to do CQRS. So right. um, you might want to look at Jay Hipster Lite for that because they do implement the hexagonal architecture with DDD and mm -hmm. a lot of, there is no like CRUD generation, but they show you how you would do CRUD. And I'm sure there's probably cool. someone that's worked on an example that's how to do CQRS over there as well. Awesome. Um, okay, and then one more. Is there any ETA on the JHipster 8 release? So I've been pushing as much as I can uh, to try to get people to at least do an alpha release. And I think we're close. The, uh, the Node 18 fish issue I found in the last 24 hours is kind of like, oh, we shouldn't release it yet. We should fix that. But also there's another thing, and that's upgrading from Vue 2 to Vue 3. So I do plan mm -hmm. to look at that in the next couple of weeks. And uh, I think once we get to that point, we could do an alpha release. And even we probably could do one today because if you notice, like my whole demo worked, right? And we did a lot of stuff with the microservices architecture. So, you know, maybe this video will motivate people to, to release it. 
Cool. Well, that's all the questions. Uh, Matt, thanks again for uh, giving this presentation. I learned a lot today. Uh, it was a lot of fun watching you go through this. Um, anything you want to kind of close with as far as JHipster and reactive microservices go? Um, no, uh, may the auth be with you. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you. All right. Before we get out of here, I have a couple of things I just want to share. Um, I want to share uh, this slide here with about Spring Academy. Uh, this is a new service over that you can find more about at spring.academy. This is our on-demand education uh, developed and curated by the world's foremost experts in Spring. Uh, it's a really great service, easy to follow learning path. Uh, we get some great hands-on labs in browser, code editing and debugging. And then one of the really cool features I love about this is if you go to the pro version, there is a free version and a pro version. If you go to the pro version, there is a certification prep course. Uh, so this is really great. Something that used to cost a lot previously is now very accessible to everyone. I'm excited about this. So go check out spring.academy. Again, thanks for Matt. Thanks to Matt for joining us today and presenting. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you back on the next episode of The Golden Path to Spring One. Bye, everyone.